The Other One by Brian Aldiss Chapter One Cablegram In the dark, someone was struggling and pleading, threatening and pleading for release. Someone ugly and hurt, helpless but powerful. Eric lays and be woke, groaning. He pressed his face into the pillow, letting his chin rasp on the soft nylon. As his mind cleared, he was aware of the warmth of his wife, Linda, beside him. He sighed heavily, lifting his head to listen to her quiet breathing. At this moment he felt no tenderness for her, only anger, anger that she could sleep so peacefully while he suffered so much. Because the vision of someone struggling had been no dream, now Eric was awake, the other still struggled and called, bullied and whined. <laughs> Shivering, Eric sat up. The luminous dial of his watch told him that it was 2.30 in the morning, Tuesday. Five days more and he had to rejoin his spaceship, Regent Park, as first astrogator, for the year-long trip to Pluto Station and back, only five days. He reached out instinctively to touch Linda, scarcely able to stop himself crying aloud at the thought of leaving her. Yet in a way it might be better aboard the Regent Park, the other might not be able to get at him once they were space-born. He might be able to leave the other behind, just as he had to leave Linda. The other had only been after him for seven days. All the time it had gained steadily in power. At first Eric could ignore its whisper. Then this had grown more insidious and persistent. It had developed from a mere voice into a presence. Already it had the power to rouse him from his sleep. By tomorrow, darling, what is it? Even as he heard the fear and compassion in his wife's voice, Eric realized he had been sobbing aloud. Her arm came round his shoulders as she rolled over towards him. I'm sorry I woke you, Lindy, he said. Yet it was a lie. His sense of utter desolation faded at the sound of her voice. You don't want to go back to that ship, do you, darling? Linda guessed why you don't throw it up and get an earth job, darling. You were worried Lauer last week, I could see. It's something more than that, he said chokingly. As she switched on the bed light, Eric slid from between the sheets and paced up and down the room. He had to tell her. It was right to tell her, and imperative. Something's after me, he said, looking away from his wife. I didn't tell you because I didn't want to frighten you, and because it's hard to describe. It's, I think it's an enemy, the worst enemy I ever had. Yet in a way it's a friend. It's, it's very tiny and helpless, but at the same time it's a giant, which has the power to kill me. I know that sounds nonsense, Lindy, but this thing has all the, these qualities at once. It's so intangible, you see. Sometimes it seems right close to me, and another time it might be millions of miles away. You'll think I'm crazy. The sense of being surrounded, it's almost impossible to put it into words. His voice petered out. The other was there still, trying to listen, lurking behind a flimsy barrier. It was like having a wolf at the door, the swing door. In a moment it would figure that I just had to pu pu push to get in. Silence fell in the bedroom. He looked at her, huddled nervously in the bed. Is this thing human? Linda asked at last. In a tiny voice? No, Eric said. No, I don't think it can be human. Her eyes stared in the dim light. She no longer looked her beautiful self. Her face was flat, mongoloid. Eric flicked his gaze away, aware he would have to take care to keep all his movements and thoughts under control. I call it the other, he said. After what seemed a long while, Linda climbed out of bed, slipped on a blue robe, and announced shakily that she would go down and brew coffee. 
Eric listened furtively at the top of the stairs, afraid she might call the police on the visiphone. He could see she... He had scared her. No doubt she thought he was going crazy. So did he. Standing there rigidly, he became aware of how chilly it was. The breeze stirred his pyjamas. The light seemed to flicker. Looking up, Eric saw that this was because tattered clouds fled across the moon. Their shadows scampered over the bleak waste all around him. Nothing lived but those shadows, not a bush, a weed, a blade of grass. Wrapping his arms around his chest for warmth, Eric looked anxiously about. Loneliness flooded in from all sides. Here he was exposed and defenceless. Here the other could get him. The great dreary circle of the horizon was punctuated by only one landmark. Two miles away, his own house stood, dark but welcoming, against the sky. Thankfully, Eric began to rush towards it. He could not think why he had left it. As he ran, he peered back over his shoulder. Nothing followed but the scudding shadows. They were harmless, yet they alarmed him in his near-panic state. Resolutely, he kept his eyes on his own home. Their lights were coming on, patching the black shape with squares of illumination. Lindy, he called. He seemed to be swimming rather than running. His house was now a blaze of light. Light surrounded it like a halo. The house gleamed at him like an owl's eye. It was occupied. The other was there, waiting for him. Eric stopped suddenly, filled with horror. He tripped and fell, tumbling among the shadows, down the stairs, fighting to slow his descent. Crazy patterns jigged before his eyes. Something crooked was running to meet him. As he hid, hit the bottom of the stairs, the thing seized him. He could not make it out. It seemed to have no face. He fought it, shouting it, shouted back, a high mewing note. Gradually, Eric realized it was calling his name. He relaxed, trying to understand what else it was saying. His vision cleared as the thing's grip tightened round him. Now he could see its face. It was Linda, his wife. She was crying as she called to him. He was too gar far gone to feel any relief at the sight of her. A terrible lethargy stole over him, as if his limbs had been sunk in concrete. He could make out neither what had happened nor where he was. Dull pain chased the crazy patterns from his head. You fell down the stairs, he heard her saying. You fell down the stairs, did you hear yourself, Eric? Are you all right, darling? Just a minute, he whispered. She went and fetched the coffee. They drank it crouching at the foot of the stairs. With the warm liquid came recovery, and life and intelligence soaking back, Eric sat up, his head clearing. I had a sort of hallucination, he confessed. I must have chipped down the staircase. I'm okay. No bones working. My left leg hurts a bit. That's all. You cried out loudly, darling, she said. He knew it had been more than a hallucination. The other had now found a way to tamper directly with his brain. It was getting stronger. I need help, he whispered to himself. Linda held his hand. Her face was as pale as Eric's, her fingers as cold. I'll drive you down to the Ferris Way Central Clinic in the morning, she said. Young Clark Siddle, my old boss's son, works there. I'm sure he'd help. He's an expert in mental disorders. She broke off, shocked at having phrased it so bluntly to Eric. He wanted to protest. The protest bubbled within him, but found no outlet. When they had drunk up their coffee, Eric let himself be led upstairs to bed. His left leg pained him so much that he knew he would spend the rest of the night awake. As soon as his head pressed down on the pillow, he was asleep. It was as easy as falling off a cliff. In the morning he felt better. The other gave no sign of its existence, 
The night was just another nightmare, something to be discarded and forgotten as soon as possible. His leg hardly ached at all. His head was clear. When Linda spoke again of going to see Dr. Siddle, Eric laughed it off. We've only five more days leave, he said. Let's not waste them hanging around clinics. At breakfast the mail arrived. With the letters came the cable gram addressed to Eric. Conscious of a constricted feeling round his heart, Eric opened it and read, You cannot win. Stop. Surrender or die. Stop. Eric Lazenby. His jerking hand knocked a plate flying from the table. The cable fluttered to the floor. Linda jumped up. He noticed it in the middle of his fear, but did not come over to him. Instead, she reached down, scooped up the piece of paper from the floor and surveyed it blankly. When her eyes again turned to her husband, they were empty of all understanding. Don't stare at me like that, you fool, Eric said harshly. Gripping the edge of the table? Can't you see what it is? It's a cable. From me to myself. Warning me that I'm going to die. She shook her head slowly, horror flooding into her face. The, pem the paper trembled in her grasp. It is just a circular for a new detergent, she whispered. It's an advert, nothing more. Eric, you're, you're really going crazy. He hardly comprehended what she was saying. She was backing towards the door. The circular fluttered to the floor unnoticed. Suddenly he realized what was happening and jumped up, ignoring the stab of pain in his left leg. Linda, he cried urgently. Linda, don't leave me for heaven's sake. Again his vision was blurring. Her face seemed to wear that terrifying mongoloid look again. She turned and ran from the room. Eric blundered after her. Linda ran down the corridor through the hall, wrenched open the front door, slammed it behind her. Eric crashed against it, standing helplessly with his forehead and the palms of his hands pressed hard against the panels. Tremors shook him. After a minute he was able to collect himself enough to stagger back into the dinerette. There he picked up the detergent advert, which still looked like a cable gram to him. He knew what this meant. The other was growing stronger. It was eating reality from him, remorselessly. He sat at the table, face in hands, until the men came for him from the clinic. Linda stood to one side, pale of face, as he was half carried into the waiting ambulance. Chapter 2 Slidogram The way to the bathroom kept changing. I told myself such things did not happen. I said to myself, It's all part of whatever is wrong with you, Eric. There is only one way to the bathroom. Your memory is just tangled up. God, let it be that and nothing else. In those days I addressed God a lot, almost as much as I talked to myself. It was just not the bathroom that moved. The isolation block in which I was confined alone consisted of eleven rooms, a dining room, a living room, where I spent most of my time, a games room with a table, tennis table, and punch ball, that bathroom, the lavatory, and six fair-sized single bedrooms, of which mine was the only one occupied. Everything was on one floor. Fortunately, for I was too weak at first to climb stairs. As the days passed, I became more and more sure that these rooms and the corridors connecting them formed an ever-changing pattern, either that or I was mad, and both alternatives sent goose flesh, running like sweat over me. Uh, maybe I could have borne madness, had I ever known sanity. Maybe I could have borne stealthily shifting rooms, does not indifference eventually cover everything? But these factors combined with the isolation were just too much, 
The universe was the isolation block, and it had to be something more. There had to be a beyond, a freedom, another place, something more than a shuffling riddle. I had to get out, out. Connive, kick, kill, but get out. So I became crafty. After breakfast one day, past my seventh in isolation, although at first my perception had been too dim for me to keep count of days, I went into the living room, leaving the door open behind me. Then I angled the chair round slightly and sat on it, so that without appearing to do so I could see one of the bedroom doors just across the corridor. There I sat looking at it, hardly fluttering an eyelid. Nothing happened. I just sat there, growing tenser and tenser, until it felt as if I might suddenly blow apart. I was still sitting there when the nurse came in. She appeared very silently. She scared me so much. I went into peals of nervous laughter. My laughter went on and on. It was something quite outside me or my control, and it frightened me more than the nurse did. This nurse, who said her name was Baron, was the first thing I could remember when I regained consciousness seven or however many days ago it had been. There had just been nothing at first, nothing but a meaningless image of a man struggling with invisible force in mid-air. I did not know who that man was or anything about him, and after some while he faded, allowing me a chance to take in my sick room. One sick room is much like another, and this one was more like them than most, if you follow me. All the same, I was a long time exploring the dull paucity of his detail, because my mind was so pay painfully sluggish. At first I could not even comprehend what a room was. My brain felt as if it had been frozen. The unconsciousness which had enfolded it like deep arctic water seemed to have left its print in every cell, fogging over memories, hopes, thoughts, Everything I did not know or care who I was. I was out per without personality or habits. When Baron came in, her first job was always to change my soiled, soiled bed linen. What is surprising is that although it was, I was at such a low ebb, I was constantly preoccupied with one question, which may be phrased roughly like this. What kind of state of unconsciousness had I been in, and what kind of state of consciousness was I in now? At the time, the question did not present itself in words. It was not as clear-cut as that, but more like a dark cloud over all my sky. As I lay there, I was a baby-born adult, to whom nothing is known. I had all the fears of a baby without the comfort of a mother. My only comfort was barren, coming silently to dress the wound on my left <laughs> leg. And I worried, as a baby might have done, over where I had come from, and what had been the nature of the darkness which had enclosed me like a womb. No, not womb. Tomb. The unconsciousness had been cold. That was all I could remember about it, or rather that was what I could not forget about it. As I trembled lest I fell back into it again. Other things than cold had filled that long blackness. Dreams, phantasms. But these eluded the dredging hand of my memory. The preoccupation with this horrible void which constituted all my past gradually left me. I began to take more notice of Bowen. She always wore the traditional nurse's uniform with a mask which covered all of her face below her eyes. Her eyes frightened me. When I grew well enough to react that much, a gulpy feeling of indefinable dread slid up my throat whenever she approached. When she dressed my wound, I knew the flesh turned cold beneath her efficient touch. By the light creases round her eyes, I judged that she was in her late thirties. She was big and solid. Once when she slipped off the, ruby, the rubber gloves she habitually wore, I saw that the fingers of her right hand were spatulate and heavily stained with nicotine. What first began to alarm me about Bowen was her boots. She wore thick black stockings on her legs and on her feet. Heavy boots, they were like army boots, except that their soles were of deep and yielding crepe. In my weak state I found the contrast between her determined aspect 
and her absolutely noiseless tread, unnerving, almost supernatural. And then I began to think that she was a man in disguise. She, if it was a she, came into the isolation block five times a day, firstly to take my temperature, dress my leg, bring my breakfast, then in mid-morning to tidy up, then briefly to bring me to lunch, then briefly to bring me to supper, and lastly to close things down for another of those long, soundproof nights which always left me convinced that the rest of the human race was dead. She spoke very little in a husky voice. To almost anything I asked, I received short and unsatisfactory answers. Why am I isolated here like this? I inquired as soon as I had found my voice. The disease from which you suffer is a rare one and highly infectious, he said. If other people had contact with you, they would die. Why do no doctors come to visit me? People come and see you when you are asleep, she said. She said it quietly. It struck me as being the most sinister thing yet. I just shut my eyes and did not dare to ask any more questions. I was a monster, tended by monster. That night I was more afraid of the dark than I'd ever been, and afraid of myself. I put out the bedside light, determined not to sleep. For half an hour I lay awake, until I imagined sound outside my door made me fumble for the light again. The switch worked, but the room remained dark. With dry open mouth, I sat there propped on one arm, right hand extended, not daring to move. As the tension in me slowly, slowly relaxed, I thought again of what Baron had said. I asked myself what the disease might be from which I suffered. That was when I knew for sure that things were grossly wrong. A man can tell certain facts about his body. I knew from the feel of mine that it was not diseased. Apart from a minor knock on the leg, nothing was wrong with me. And since knocks on the leg are not infectious, I ought not to be in isolation. I was not a patient. I was a victim. As if against my own will, I fell asleep. I woke to find Baron marchlessly, soundlessly into the bedroom. Morning had come again. Humbly, I asked for cigarettes and matches. To my surprise, she produced them. Now I should have some sort of illumination. For the coming night... Pursuing this line of thought, I tried my bedside lamp when the nurse had gone. It worked perfectly. By this time I was able to walk about easily enough. Leaving my breakfast unturned, untouched on its tray, I got out of bed and went to the door. There was another door closed, facing me across the corridor. Swinging my dead leg, I booted it open. It was the bathroom. Yesterday the bathroom had been up... The corridor and an empty bedroom had faced mine. You don't make mistakes over things like that. Not unless you're mad. Not unless you're mad. God, don't let me be mad. Here is something easily checked. If brain can be pressed to function as required, draw a plan of the room layout. Keep it under your pillow. Compared to tomorrow morning, there were <laughs> pencils and paper in the living room. I ran down the passage, turned left, and there was another turn in the corridor that I could have sworn was not there yesterday. It was another left turn. Doggedly, I took it. It was a cul-de-sac containing only one door. I opened it. There was the living room. Before I got the paper and pencil, I went to look out of the window. The isolation block was badly provided with windows, which seemed to exist only on one side of the building. Outside there was nothing to see but a bleak and featureless plain, with the blue conifer forest and what looked like a lake on the horizon. Never once had I seen a human figure out there, never a living thing moving. I collected a pencil and a sheet of paper, on the top of which I had written my name five times, 
Eric Lazenby, Eric Lazenby, Eric Lazenby, Eric Lazenby, Eric Lazenby. It was almost the only item worth knowing that I had gleaned from Bowen. It seemed to me I could construct my plan of the block most easily by beginning from my bedroom. I went back up the passage, turned right, and there was not a second right turn at all. Yet I distinctly recalled making two left turns going, which would mean two right ones coming back. I stopped dead facing a blank wall. I got the cigarettes out and put one in my mouth, steadying myself with my other hand because I suddenly felt dizzy. I lit the cigarette with a precious match and tentatively opened the door on my right. It was the living room. I had just left down the corridor. The dead plane stared in through the window at me. Suddenly I was no longer afraid. Fury ran in my veins. My head became surprisingly clear. As I stubbed out the cigarette I realised I had never smoked one before. With the aid of my tie I began making measurements of corridors and rooms. As I had suspected the proportions bore a definite relationship to each other. As I worked reassurance came back to me. Not only because I now was sure I had not been having hallucinations, but because at last something of my past was beginning to seep through to me. I knew that much of my life had been spent measuring, probing, looking for relationships. To do the same thing now, although crudely and with my tie, brought back an inescapable sense of familiarity. I had been something called an astrogator. I had gone into somewhere called space. Everything seemed remote, as if these partial memories were someone else's. It is an odd feeling to have one's world return link by link. I was like a runner with a flaming torch, speeding through a honeycomb, cell after cell lit up as I appeared, staying lit after I had gone. With renewed vigour I assailed the problem immediately before me. When I thought I had all the components of it, I went into the living room and sat down to concentrate on putting them methodically together into a solution. Method. That and perseverance serves almost as well as genius. They did this time. I felt sure I could see the kind of predicament I was in. Now a test to make sure. If my theory was right, I was being watched. Accordingly, all the time I was thinking... I slumped myself over a table and heaved my shoulders as if I was crying. But through my intertwined fingers, I watched the corridor, watched it like grim death. And in a little while it changed shape. The room opposite slid away and another took its place. It made my stomach quiver, although I had been expecting it. Nobody like, likes to see his house shuffled around like a pack of cards. Now what about the madness, the horrible disease? Had that just been a nasty bluff, partly designed to give another shake to my nerves? For this was not an isolation block at all. It was a torture chamber. Someone was riding me. Escape, and the best time for that. I knew it was after dark, when the unseen watchers had switched off the electricity and the silent doctors came to see me. So I waited for the night, with a sick feeling for company. I tried to do the little things I usually did, take a doze, play patience, to fool the unseen watchers, but covertly I was observing the view out of the window. I wanted to watch it and get dark. You see, if my theory was correct, that was not a view at all. It was a mock-up of plaster and plastic, such as you see in museums, when stuffed birds are exhibited in their natural habitat. It was a mock-up. It was the best ever. Grey clouds flitted across the sky. The light changed on the distant lake. Only when the dark began to fall did I think the creators of the panorama had made a mistake. It seemed to me, although I had noticed nothing to time the process with, that it grew dark too quickly. 
They should have taken longer sliding the rheostat over, I thought triumphantly. I'd kill them if I ever got to them. The windows would not open, or I was sure I could have leant out and plucked those little trees by the far away sheet of water. This was how I viewed the situation. You will have seen those sliding number puzzles schoolboys carry about. They are, say, two inches square and contain fifteen little squares, each a half inch by a half inch and numbered one to fifteen. The sixteenth square is left blank so that the others can be slid around. The trick is to get the numbers in the right order. Slidergrams, they used to call them. I was in a big slidergram. Diner, living room, games room, bathroom, lavatory. Six bedrooms. These accounted for eleven of the squares, and the rest was occupied by corridor space. The watchers could slide them about into any combination at will, just to shake me into the frame of mind they needed me in, just for the joy of seeing me suffer. The view from the window was a fake, otherwise it would have changed as the position of the room changed, and that would have made the game too obvious. Claustrophobia attacked me as I visualised myself being switched about, inside the slidergram by invisible machinery. And although I had worked it out all so coolly, I was trembling like a leaf most of the time. I knew someone had gone to an awful lot of trouble over me. Why? What had I done to deserve this? Why had I even been granted life? Suddenly I hated life. It means you spend your days and nights nearly wetting your pants in fright. Well, they had me now. I was trapped. By the thoroughness of the preparations, I could see I was never intended to live normally. I heard the bolts go back, one, two, three on the outside of the door, and then Baron entered my room. She had brought my supper. If I overpowered her, I could run out of the door, but I guess there would be guards outside. Besides... I did not know if I could overpower her, if it was her, if it was a her. Just to touch her, him, might bring down fifty screaming killers upon me. My leg is bad again, I said. May I have a sedative to make me sleep in tonight? I will bring one on my next round. When you're in bed, she said. She left the room to go and get my bed ready. She did not hesitate over which way to go. There was need, no need for her to hang about and watch me gulp my bread and milk down. In the ceilings of each room would be a spy holes through which little piggy eyes could regard my every movement. I swore to eat those eyes one day. Carefully leaning forward and shielding my forehead with my hand, as if it ached, I spooned the bread and milk down inside my collar. It felt disgusting. I could trace the path of the sloppy cubes of bread slithering grandly down my ribs, soaking into shirt and trousers, or whatever it was I wore. At least nobody watching from overhead could see I was not eating the stuff properly. I had guessed that this, my last bit of nourishment of the day, would be well soused with sleeping draught, otherwise with all the worries I had I should never have slept at all. As far as I knew, I had not eaten a meal since coming to this trap. When Baron came back at last, I was snuggled down in bed, still with dried hunks of bread clinging to my stomach. She brought three sleeping bill pills and a glass of water, as she did once before when I had complained of a headache. She left my room once I was preparing to swallow them. That way I should be off guard, and the watchers would see what I did went unsuspecting. Putting the pills up to my mouth, I palmed them like a conjurer, swallowed, sipped water, gulped convincingly. This was my little artistic touch, intended to lull any extra interest they might have in me over my earlier performance with the tie. I guess that if they saw me doing anything unusual, they would come down and kill me. 
Lying back on the pillow, I closed my eyes and gradually regularized my breathing. I rolled onto one side and let my mouth fall open. There I lay to all intents fast asleep, until Baron came back into the room. By then I was dangerously near a self-induced sleep. I opened one eyelid a crack. Baron had finished a few chores around the block. Now, after the most cursory glance at me, she was ready to go off duty. Obviously, she had not a doubt of in her ugly skull. I was out cold for eleven hours. She had undone her gaze mask, letting it dangle round her neck, and was lit lighting a cigarette, flooding the room with smoke. Bowen had blue jowls and a heavy moustache. It did not surprise me, but it shocked me. At least it showed this, that the enemy was not vigilant all of the time. They had their moments of relaxation and inattention. Perhaps they did not watch at all at night. They had weaknesses through which I could strike back at them. After several deep draws on his cigarette and a casual tidy of the objects in my room, Baron came over to the bedside and flipped off the light. Then he went out, down the corridor, and left by the front door. I listened to the bolts go on to the out to on the outside. I sat up. I was so confined the whole idea of movement felt strange to me. If they had infrared apparatus to observe me in the dark mine was a lost cause, but I guess that this was unlikely. They had been too careful to immobilize me during the hours of night. Two possible ways of escape presented themselves to me. I could either try to slip out between the moving walls of the slider gram when a reshuffle was in progress, or I could hide in the corridor and slip out of the door when the doctors came in. I never doubted that they would come in, for they had the best of reasons for wanting to examine me. They hated me, and must find the most efficient way of killing me. I did not fancy it the chance of being mashed between two slowly closing rooms. I would wait to slip out of the front door. Heart beating unsteadily, I climbed out of bed and put my clothes on. Did they feel like blotting paper? It was amazing what a grip I had managed to get on myself. I felt capable of dealing with anything or anyone, yet I wondered if I had a body and what its function were. Then I went into the hall, prepared to deal with hell itself, if need be, standing there in the dark. I readied myself to spring for freedom. I could feel myself growing. Chapter 3 Decagram The two doctors, Siddle and Van Buren, straightened up and looked at each other. Clark Siddle sighed heavily. Another crisis due, he said. I wonder if either Lazenby or the other will be able to withstand it. It looks to me like the ultimate one. Better prepare him, Van Buren said, rising slowly from the chair before the chemist screen. He was older, solider than Siddle, yet the weariness of looking into the screen had told on him as much as on his most impressionable companion. The combined oral and visual impressions emitted from the Kenistons were overpowering. Van Buren switched them off as he rose, and the image of the creature waiting by the bolted door vanished. It seemed impossible that the nightmare world of this thing in the slidergram could have been projected at them from the patient who now lay quietly on the nearby bed, his shaven skull covered with rods and terminals, which were the senses, the sensory equipment of the Keniston. The patient, Eric Lazenby, stirred as the young nurse came forward at Von Bowen's bidding and applied the reviver. Reviver for you. Impulses from the troubled regions of his brain had been tapped, 
amplified, scanned, decoded, edited, and finally broadcast in terms of sight and sound by the big machine into which Siddle and Van Buren had been peering. But of all this, Lazenby appeared to know nothing. He woke now, wide-eyed, his mouth opening and shutting as if in the mute rehearsal of an angry speech. Nothing to worry about, old fellow, Van Buren said, coming over and looking down at him kindly. You are in the Fairsway Central Clinic, and Dr. Siddle and I are taking care of you. My wife, Lindy. She will come to see you soon, Van Buren said soothingly, turning to signal to Clark Siddle. The latter quietly left the room, walking down the corridor to the waiting room at the far end. As he opened the door, he saw that, despite her anxiety, Linda Lazenby had been asleep in the chair. But as soon as he entered, she sat up and said, Eric? Siddle smiled, first with professional reassurance, then voluntarily, as he made a delicate transition from brain specialist to young man. He had always enjoyed smiling at Linda, even in the days when she was his father's secretary. Now a year of marriage had merely ripened her, making her more beautiful than ever. Your husband will be better soon, Linda, he said. I hope. His is a strange case, but we can tackle it. She seemed to doubt him. He's not insane, she asked. Not in any normal meaning of the word, although he will be if we cannot give him some relief soon. I see. Then this other exists? Her voice was faint. Siddle took her hands as he answered yes. What is it, she asked, withdrawing her hands. Please sit down, Mrs. Lazenby, Siddle said, abruptly becoming more professional. Your husband is asking to see you, but before you go in, I think it is advisable to tell you something about his condition. Dr. Van Buren and I have seen the other and watched it at work. Yet it is real enough, in a sense. We have the means here to send impulses into any part of the patient's brain. The impulses return and are translated into early, easily comprehensible sight and sound images. So we have been able to look at the other, appreciate its point of view, and even follow its twisted thought processes. It is, it is something in my husband's mind. Yes, it has no true realization of its own whereabouts or identity. It imagines itself vaguely to be a man, trapped by unknown and cruel enemies in, in a slidogram. He went on elaborating for Linda's benefit the drama of isolation and anxiety which the doctors had observed through the Kensington screen. And all this happens in Eric's mind, Linda asked. Yes, although he is unaware of most of it, you see, the other is really... He paused, listening. Footsteps clattered down the corridor. The nurse who had been attending Eric Lazenby burst into the waiting room. Dr. Van Berwen says, please come quickly, she breathed. The patient has got out of bed and is growing violent. Coming, Siddle sprinted back down the corridor, the nurse just behind him. Through the open door of the single ward he could see the shadows dancing crazily. Running in, he was in time to see Eric collapse on slowly onto the bed. Van Buren steadying him. I just managed to lay him out in time, Van Buren said, panting, setting down a hypodermic. Nurse, stand by with the oxygen, will you? I gave him rather a heavy dose, I'm afraid. He pushed me backwards, struck out at the light, and was just going for the Kensingtons. I stopped him the only way I could before he did irreparable damage. With Siddle's help, the nurse tucked Eric back into bed. Unobserved, Linda had entered the room. She stood now, looking down with compassion at the heavy face and shaven head of her husband. He was scarcely recognisable. We'd better try the last stage now, Siddle said to Van Bowen. I'll have to tell the girl before we turn her out. We need her permission before attempting anything dangerous. Go ahead, Van Bowen said, turning his solid back on Siddle. 
His hands were trembling. Mrs. Lazenby, Siddle said, as he saw her behind him, your husband's sanity, if not his life, is threatened, and I must operate immediately. I require your sanction before going ahead. Tell me what is wrong with him, she said. Perhaps you know something of cysts. <coughs> they are bags of morbid matter, often with a hard shell, which appear in the body. When opened, they are sometimes found to contain hair or teeth, or fingernails, or even all three together. A cyst is a bubble of unused embryonic material, isolated from the fetus in which it occurs, and thus unable to develop normally. Often it causes no trouble until the person in whom it lodges reaches, well, your husband's age, for instance. Linda was leaning back against the wall, not looking at Siddle. My husband has such a cyst? she asked. Not exactly. Your husband has a cyst lodged into the silent area of his brain. It is a small thing, weighing perhaps only a decagram. Unfortunately, this cyst contains morbid brain tissue. It has consciousness, life, if you like, of its own. It is about to burst and flood your husband's brain. She pressed her forehead as if she could personally feel the weight of the fatal decagram. The cyst is presumably the other, she said. He, Eric, told me it was not human. He was quite correct, Van Bowen said, coming forward. This cyst, though so small, is a real monster. It has cunning without conscience, life without responsibility. In short, it is insane. We have been able to watch its thought processes on the screen here. Clark Siddle gestured him to silence, explaining more gently. The other could hardly be anything but unbalanced, Mrs. Lazenby. Buried where it is, it has no contact with the external world except through such thoughts and memories as may filter to it from your husband's brain. The supply of these has recently increased. Our observations show that this is because the cyst has recently cracked, possibly because of some worry your husband has been suffering. He is due to blast off for Pluto in four days, Linda said. He, we, neither of us wanted him to go. That might account for it, Siddle admitted. Now, a sort of two-way traffic in distorted ideas is passing between your husband's and the cyst brain. They fight each other in total darkness. When Eric has the illusion that he stands outside your house with the other inside, this is an allegory of the way in which the cyst may dispossess him of his mind. When he thinks he gets a cable signed by himself, this is another warning from within. He is warring with himself. Poor Eric, Linda said, looking down at the still face on the pillow, overhung by the great bulk of the silent Kensitons. How does the broadcast you received from the thing in the slider grub fit into it? The broadcast came from the cyst itself, Siddle explained moving to the instrument panels and switching several toggles over. We were observing its actual interpretations of its peculiar environment. Professionally speaking, they were highly interesting. The other's inability to fend for itself is symbolized by its bed soiling and need to invent a nurse. This nurse, Baron, who also symbolizes its inability to master the concepts of two sexes which filter through to it from the surrounding brain. It is baffled by the idea of having a body. It asks of its clothes. Do they feel like blotting paper? Many of its problems it has rationalized. The drifting lines of thought around it, which the cyst cannot penetrate or comprehend, have become the moving walls of its prison through which it now plans to slip. Don't say any more, Linda cried, abruptly covering her face. I can't understand it. This, this other, this cyst. It's part of Eric after all. It lives in him. It is him. Did you not say it knew itself to be an astrogator like Eric? Siddle put his arms round her shoulder comfortingly. Yes, I said that he agreed. The cyst, rebelling against your husband's supremacy, is nevertheless forced to take on part of his identity. 
since it has no identity of its own. After all, it has little imagination. Witness the way it scales down the idea of outside, which is too big for it to cope with. A distant view from a window becomes a model. It could easily destroy. In fact, all it really knows is that it has, it is in a spot and will do anything to get free. It's hateful, she exclaimed. I'm sorry for Eric, of course, but I can't help pitting this trapped thing too. Van Boon moved restlessly on the other side of the bed. There is no room for pity, he said. This cyst is malignant, paranoid, a killer. You must give us leave at once to deal with it, if we can, and kill it before it kills your husband's brain. Distraught, she looked up at Clark Siddle. Is there no alternative? None, he said gently. The cyst is about to burst and take over your husband's mind. The matter is urgent. You must do what you must, he said listlessly. Are you going to operate? That is impossible, Siddle replied. The cyst is too deeply buried in the brain to be accessible. We have our own way of dealing with it. He beckoned to the nurse who stood nearby, biting her lip. Take Mrs. Lazenby to the waiting room, he said. I will come for her when it's all over. Chapter 4 Kilogram The little ward was filled with the low notes of the machine. Siddle lay on a couch, his head enveloped by a metallic helmet connected to the keniston. Van Buren stood anxiously over him. This is reckless, Clark, he said. Once I have projected your mind into Lazenby's, you are on your own and I can't help you. You'll be facing a killer single-handed and empty-handed. I have to go in there, Siddle replied. Lazenby is helpless. He doesn't know what he's up against. Plug me through and keep your fingers crossed. Shrugging his massive shoulders, Van Bowen went to the machine, sat down, tuned in. On the deep screen, the grey shadows moved and twisted. A feeling of perspective formed, warped in closer, seemed to rise up and enfold the doctor. Siddle gave a low cry from his couch. Then his identity was swept into Eric Lazenby's brain. It was like a physical shock. Siddle stood in a whirling mist over a bottomless pit, under a fathomless sky. Of his own agonized volition, he pressed forward. The world darkened and solidified around him. A murmur as of tortured waters filled his ears. Although there could be no sense of direction where he was, something drew him on, a whiff of evil, an aroma of menace. He was drawing towards the other. As he drew nearer, the power of the other grew. He ceased gradually and confusedly to think of it as a cyst. It was a killer, capable of taking any shape, waiting to overcome him. Blast him flat. Tensely he moved forward. Now he could see the other stronghold. From within, Siddle knew it was a slider grump from outside. It was an amorphous mass. Big as a mountain. Its heights hidden in mist. Nothing in this never, never land of the mind could be viewed objectively. To him it is one thing. To the adversary... Another. Siddle moved in, but his emanations must have penetrated the other's fortress. Before he was ready, the other struck. The whole thing was over in a flash, a thunderclap of terror. The great mountain screamed, splitting clean down the middle. The interior blazed like a furnace, prancing like a horse. The other emerged savagely, a ghastly monster of hair and teeth and errant eyeballs, high as a house, deep as a dynamo. The screaming grew, not coming only from the gaping mountain, but pouring out from everywhere.
Second, Siddle barely kept his wits. Then as the charging thing was almost on him, he spread, changed, flowed. His imagination labouring, he became a landscape, wide, dreary, all-encompassing. It was the one thing of which the other could have no knowledge, could not face. Mile on mile, Siddle spread himself out, a planet full of desolation. The other dwindled, rose, rolled itself into a globe, <laughs> shrunk and vanished. The horrible screaming died away. Weakly, Siddle drew himself together, his strength utterly spent. For a second he lost consciousness. Everything faded about him when he was aware of himself. Once more he was back in his own prone body, and the hum of the Kentons, which had brought him safely back, was sinking into nothingness. Van Boon was leaning over him anxiously. Lesion be, Siddle managed to ask. He'll be fine. What about you? I'll be okay. What happened to the other? Van Bowen spread wide his palms. On the screen, it was difficult to see, he said. Everything happened so fast. Your images were fused with his. Directly, the other was confronted by a wide open space. It was attacked, as you so cleverly guessed it would be, by its own major weakness, agoraphobia. It dwindled into a ball and bounced on over the horizon. That should have finished it, I imagine. Eric Lazenby groaned and stirred as he finished speaking. Van Bern went over to him. The patient was not yet conscious, but already he looked better, less haggard. Gathering his strength, Siddle sat up. The other bounced over the horizon. My horizon, he said, integratively. Yes, Van Bern replied, without turning from the bed. At that point, the cyst vanished from Lazenby's mind. I checked that on the Kensington. You exorcised it, Clark. I see, Siddle murmured. He stood up cautiously. He felt oddly weak. On the bed, Eric coughed and opened his eyes. I'll go and get Linda, Mrs. Lazenby, Siddle said. He went out, walking unsteadily down the corridor, the recent horror still swirling, swirling over his mind like an angry sea. His vision was blurred. A sudden feeling of nausea overcame him at the door of the waiting room. Groaning, he clutched at the knob for support. Hearing the noise, Linda jumped up and ran to the door. When she opened it, Siddled appeared, shaking his head. Eric, she said questioningly. Yes, Siddle answered. Here I am. You want me. I want you. I've come for you. He slammed the door behind him. She backed away, mouth open in terror, but he ran at her. As his hands went round her throat, she heard what he was shouting. Baron! Baron! Got you at last, you devil!'